Hello and welcome to the Port Harcourt School of AI. My name is Julia Stojanovic. I am an assistant professor of computer science and engineering and of data science at New York University. Today, it will be my pleasure to give you an overview of responsible data science in 40 minutes or less. Data science is great. The convergence of unprecedented data collection capabilities, enormous computational power, and broad acceptance of data collection and analysis as a way to move society forward is offering us tremendous opportunities to do good. We can make people's lives more fulfilling and more convenient by recommending to them what movie they should watch or what food they should eat. We can accelerate scientific discovery in areas ranging from astrophysics to medicine. We can boost innovation in a myriad of ways from self-driving cars to advertisement targeting and back. We can improve society by improving how governments function, by helping make resource distribution more equitable, and by bringing greater transparency and accountability to government operations. So in a word, our goal is progress. Unfortunately, we're also seeing time and again that things can go very wrong when we start applying data science without a strong and proactive focus on a balance between the benefits and the risks. I will give some examples now that concern the irresponsible use of data-driven algorithmic techniques in hiring and employment. One of the earliest indications that there is cause for concern came in 2015 with the results of the Ad Fisher study out of Carnegie Mellon University that was broadly circulated in the press. The authors ran an experiment in which they created two sets of synthetic profiles of web users who were the same in every respect in terms of their demographics, stated interests and browsing patterns with a, a single exception, their stated gender. One group stated their gender as male and the other as female. In one experiment, the Ad Fisher tool simulated an interest in jobs in both groups. Job seekers, once again, did not differ either in their browsing behavior or in their preferences or demographics. The only difference between them was their stated gender. The researchers showed that Google displayed ads for a career coaching service for high paying executive jobs far more frequently to the male group than to the female group. This brings back memories of the time when it was legal in the US to advertise jobs by gender in newspapers. This practice was outlawed in the US in 1964, but it persists unfortunately in the online ad environment. Let us move forward in time and also advance to the next stage of the hiring pipeline that is resume screening, which is very often done today with the help of automatic tools. In late 2018, it was reported that Amazon's recruiting tool that was developed with the stated goal of increasing workforce diversity, <clears throat> in fact, did the opposite thing. The system taught itself that male candidates were preferable to female candidates. It penalized resumes that included the word women's, as in women's chess club captain and it downgraded graduates of two all-women's colleges. The results aligned with and reinforced a stark gender imbalance in the workforce. I'm showing on this slide on the right, the global workforce and the technology workforce breakdown for five platforms, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Google, and Microsoft, with men denoted in blue and women in red. Note that Amazon did not report this breakdown for employees in technical roles at the time when this article was written. Interestingly, despite the essentially unlimited data and computational and human resources at Amazon's disposal, the company was not able to fix the problem of gender bias in the workforce, in their own workforce even, by means of a technological intervention. Another example, later yet in the hiring pipeline, 
perhaps once somebody was already saw a job ad and then they applied and they passed the screen and then were even interviewed. Uh, and now a potential employer is doing an informal post interview check. So this example was surfaced by Latanya Sweeney. She's an African American uh, researcher, computer science researcher on the faculty at Harvard. Latanya showed that Googling for African American sounding names like her own is more likely to trigger ads that are suggestive of the individual having a criminal record. Specifically, these are ads here by a company called Instant Checkmate that you can see on the right. And these ads are triggered more frequently for African American sounding names, even if you control for whether that individual in fact has a criminal record. Other examples of discrimination include shutting out people suffering from mental illness, such as depression or bipolar disorder, on the basis of online personality tests, even if they have the right skills for the job. So what's in common between all these examples? These all can be seen as there being bias in predictive analytics. Let's see what we might mean by this term bias. Our meaning of this term is not in the traditional sense that is used by statisticians who mean that a model may be biased if it does not summarize the data correctly. Instead, we are seeing examples of societal bias exhibiting itself in the data. So let's unpack that further. Data can be thought of as an image of the world. One interpretation of bias in the data is that the image is distorted. We systematically oversample or undersample in particular parts of the world or otherwise distort the readings. In the examples of there being fewer job opportunities for women, for individuals uh, who are disabled or for individuals of color, is that we are, because we haven't been giving historically opportunity to these individuals to prove themselves on the job in executive positions, for example, we are not going to be seeing them in the data record. And so we're undersampling for these demographics. Now, another interpretation of bias in the data is however, that even if we were able to take a perfect image of the world and reflect it in the data, it would still be a reflection of the world such as it is and not necessarily how it could or should be. I'd like to make two very simple points here, but very important points. The first is that a data set itself does not know whether it's biased and for what reason. It may be that it's a broken image of a perfect world or that it's a perfect image of a broken world. Or maybe these distortions are compounded in the data, that it's a distorted, broken image of a broken world. The data set is not going to know which it is. The second point is that it is not up to a data set or up to an algorithm to know or decide whether the world is how it should be or if it needs to be improved. And if so, in what way? This is up to people to do and technology and data is here to help us people make these very important decisions, reach them by consensus. The view that we've been taking so far one where there is data that is then fed into a magic algorithmic box and then produces a decision, for example, a classification decision as I'm depicted, depicting here, is a frog's eye view. And this is because we are not asking ourselves, where did the data come from? My colleagues and I uh, have been working on formulating an understanding of what responsibility, responsible data management and responsible data science should mean if we consider the data life cycle holistically, starting from data sharing uh, and annotation to data acquisition and curation through querying and ranking and then to data analysis. And some of the properties of responsibility that we work on, and I will talk about just a few very briefly today, are fairness and diversity, transparency and accountability, privacy and data protection. 
So now let us move to a somewhat more technical topic and discuss fairness in classification. And to start, we're going to talk about binary classification, because if we don't understand what happens in the binary classification case, it's going to be difficult for us to understand what happens for more complex cases. We're talking here about vendors who are assigning outcomes, positive or negative, to individuals. Individuals are represented in the data and these outcomes matter to them. An individual wants to receive the positive outcome and they don't want to receive the negative outcome. These outcomes matter because they impact the lives and livelihoods of individuals. For example, a positive outcome is one where somebody is offered employment and the negative outcome is when they are not offered employment. Fairness and classification is concerned with how outcomes are assigned to members of a population. On your left, you see a population of 10 individuals represented as dots. The vendor's process is the blue arrow and the assignments are in the box on the right. Individuals with a plus received the positive outcome and those with a minus received the negative outcome. We can observe here that four out of 10 individuals, 40% of the population are happy. They got the positive outcome. Fairness in classification further is concerned with how subpopulations are treated because these may be treated differently. So in my example here, I can split up my population by gender into female and male and observe that although 40% of the population on the whole has the positive outcome, <clears throat> only 20% of the females, one out of five, but 60% of the males, three out of five, received the positive outcome. This seems intuitive, intuitively to us to be unfair. This is one possible interpretation of fairness uh, that falls under group fairness definitions. And this particular one is called statistical parity. Statistical parity states that demographics of the individuals receiving any outcome, positive or negative, should be the same as demographics of the underlying population. That is to say that if men and women apply for a particular job in equal proportion, then half of those receiving the positive outcome should be female and half of those receiving the negative outcome should be female and similarly for male. Now, of course, uh, there are other attributes also that we may be looking at for example, a person's score on a, uh, an academic test like the SAT in the United States. Uh, and the vendor may argue that they are actually not using a person's gender, but instead are using some other characteristics of those individuals. And here we may want to recall that we may or may not trust the data. We may or may not trust the test scores that we observe in the data because the data may be biased it may be reflecting individuals' abilities differently in these test scores. Another point to make here uh, is that statistical parity and group fairness more generally is of course not the only plausible and acceptable and desirable notion of fairness. If we were to strive to achieve statistical parity here and there was only a limited number of pluses we could give, there are only four uh, positions that we can give to individuals applying, then we would need to reassign outcomes. We would need to take away a plus from somebody who had it before, give it to a female candidate and take it away from a male candidate in my example. So these two points where outcomes were swapped are denoted by a blue circle here, a blue ellipse. And what you will observe is that, of course, while overall we are happy with the outcomes, we now have a 40% female and 40% male uh, positive outcome rate. Uh, the individual, the male individual on the bottom left who now has a minus may be unhappy because they can look around and they can see that everybody who is very similar to them has a plus. So they got admitted or they got accepted for employment but they did not. And this violates this other notion of fairness called individual fairness. Individual fairness requires that any two individuals, any two people who are similar 
with respect to a particular task should receive similar outcomes, meaning that all of them should get a job in this case or none of them should. And what I'm illustrating here is that these two notions of fairness are intention that for you to satisfy group fairness, statistical parity, <clears throat> you may need to violate individual fairness because we're operating in an environment where there are resource constraints. There's only so many pluses we can give overall. What this tells us also is that <clears throat> fairness really is, is a goal that, that may be in absolute terms elusive, that there are always these competing objectives and trade-offs that we need to consider. And one way to depict this here is that individual fairness and group fairness represent two intrinsically different worldviews. It is not the case that one of them is mathematically more correct than the other. Which of these notions we subscribe to depends on our beliefs about how the world should be and whether or not the world is such as it should be or if it should be improved. Individual fairness, roughly speaking, corresponds to the notion of equality, where everybody is literally given the same access to opportunity based on how they appear in the world today, based on how they appear in the data. So in the individual fairness or equality worldview, we're going to trust the data that we got. We're going to take the test scores at face value. So the result here is that we are giving each individual one box to try and reach the apple tree, and only one of the individuals is in fact able to have an apple. An alternative worldview that is of group fairness and of equity of outcomes is one where we don't trust the data. We say that the data perhaps misrepresents individuals through needs and abilities. And so we are going to expand more resources here. We are going to give people not three boxes, but six boxes in total. So the cost to society as symbolized by these boxes is higher for group fairness than for individual fairness. But the result is that everybody is able to reach the apple tree. And so the hope for the group fairness worldview, for the equity of outcomes worldview is that over time, the playing field will be level. The world will become a better place. We will be able to take a more faithful image of that world and the data, and we won't need to intervene, intervene quite as much. So this is the hope here. But ultimately, once again, these two notions of fairness are often in conflict. They are not mathematically incompatible. They can be mathematically incompatible, but more importantly, they are incompatible because they represent two intrinsically different worldviews. So to recap, fairness definitions uh, present to us the kinds of trolley car problems of today, because we do need to use data to make decisions. We do need to make these decisions algorithmically. And ways in which we place these constraints, fairness or diversity constraints on our solutions, are going to impact what our society looks like in the long run. So because we cannot solve this issue of fairness once and for all. Uh, I think that what we need to work on in addition to fairness is of course transparency. Being able to explain uh, what types of fairness notions we're choosing, what types of impacts our systems have on uh, the lives and livelihoods of individuals. Being able to expose these knobs that people can then turn, individuals, groups, and society at large, to understand how we want to steer our algorithmic systems. How do we want to use the systems to help us make society better rather than have them reinforce results of historical disadvantage. And this takes us to the next topic and that is transparency and interpretability. And here I want to make very quickly a couple of points. The first point is that algorithmic transparency is not the same as releasing the source code of the system that you run. Publishing the source code certainly helps, but it is sometimes unnecessary and it's often insufficient. Uh, so why doesn't it actually help for us to 
just post the, the source code of a program uh, and then claim that anybody can really understand what that program does, what impact that uh, particular system has on individuals and that it's fair or not fair. And the reason that I'm telling you about this is because in New York City uh, and in the US more broadly, we are starting to, to think very, very carefully and very hard about how to regulate uh, the use of algorithms in government decision making. And so in New York City, starting in 2017, we have this effort to uh, try and figure out what it makes to explain to people being affected, what, what it takes to explain to people being affected uh, by an algorithm that that algorithm works, that it's fair, and to generally just explain to them how it works and what they can do to challenge the processes that these algorithms embed. And what I'm showing you here is a proposal for a law. This is not a proposal that was passed, but the law ultimately was passed in a different form, quite a different form, uh, that says that whenever our New York City government is making decisions with the help of algorithms and data, uh, the city should be required to post the code, the program that implements that algorithm publicly online. This is not, once again, the, the law in the shape in which it was adopted. And the reason that I don't think it's sufficient to post the, the source code is that we are not actually going to know what the program does if we don't explain the assumptions that we made in its design and if we don't explain what the data looks like on which this program operates. Um, so here what I'm advocating for is to develop and provide to individuals, to population groups, a kind of a nutritional label that explains uh, the ingredients of an algorithm, the ingredients of a data set over which it runs, maybe on which it was trained, if this is uh, a machine learning method, and also explain its effects. Uh, I encourage you to look at this particular tool that I'm pointing to at the bottom of the screen, at data responsibly, um, that generates these nutritional labels for data sets that are ranked automatically. Um, so what are these nutritional labels? Once again, I think of them as these interpretability devices, as these annotations that we can develop and attach to data, to code, and to decisions that are made on data by these computational systems. We want these labels to be comprehensible, short, simple, and clear. We want them to be consultative, to provide actionable information to individuals being affected. They need to be comparable, implying a kind of a standard of uh, in execution and deployment by which these computational tools should abide, abide. And they need to be concrete. They need to help us determine whether a data set or a process are in fact doing their job, whether they're fit for use for a given task. The third point that I want to make is that algorithmic transparency requires data transparency. We cannot understand what an algorithm does and how it works, for example, if it's a classifier, if we don't know what data set it's classifying. Because as you know, as you've been studying in this course and elsewhere, the actual behavior of an algorithm, of a model, the model that you learn depends on the kind of data that is used for training. And so we want to, when we explain the operation of these algorithms, especially in government, we want to also explain to people what are these data assumptions that it makes what data is used to train, validate, and deploy this algorithm, uh, how did we test its validity, accuracy, and applicability. And um, this, these concerns are valid not only for machine learning systems, but also for systems that simply score and rank individuals, for example, because you're not going to know what the impact of a particular scoring and ranking procedure is unless you know what the applicant pool looks like, what the data set looks like. Um, and to the same point, data transparency is not synonymous with making all data public. Of course, our goal should be to release data whenever possible, but very often this data is going to be sensitive. It's going to be uh, proprietary. It's going to be simply sensitive in the sense that individuals will not feel comfortable 
having this data disclosed about them. And so to address this issue, uh, folks, including us, are working on developing privacy preserving synthetic data generation mechanisms. So here I'm showing you the flow of a particular such tool that we developed in my group called the data synthesizer. Again, I encourage you to, to play with it. It's available on data responsibly uh, on my website, dataresponsibly.com or .github.io. This tool takes uh, a data set is in, as input. It learns the data distributions from the data set, and then it produces a privacy preserving but synthetic data set that is statistically similar to the data that you provided, but that gives you provable guarantees on not being able to re-identify a member of the data set if this data set is published. Uh, this tool also comes with a kind of a nutritional label. It shows to the data owner the distribution or distributions along different attributes in the original data on the left and in the synthetic data that you derived on the right. Uh, and now in perhaps just a couple of minutes, I'm going to give you the preview of uh, the technology that we use as part of this data synthesizer that we ourselves did not develop, um, meaning that this technology is something that is under the umbrella of differential privacy, but we adjust and we implement these kinds of technological ideas in the specific tool. So just to give a preview of privacy very briefly, um, I'm going to ask you to play this game of truth or dare. And of course, the elephant in the room is that we're all now at home and we are uh, going outside quite rarely because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And when we do go outside, we are supposed to wear a face mask. Uh, so the question that I'm going to ask you and that you should not answer out loud, but think about quietly is, did you wear a face mask when you went out yesterday? My goal here is to be able to estimate as reliably as I can, what percentage of the population did and did not wear a face mask yesterday, while at the same time not incriminating any one of you if you happened to not have worn your face mask. So let us call this property P, that truth is yes, meaning that the, the property that you did wear a face mask yesterday is gonna be denoted P. And my goal once again is to estimate little p, and that is the fraction of the folks who are listening online for whom p holds, for who did wear a face mask yesterday. Um, and now to assist us, please go to Google or take out a physical coin and flip the coin. So if you go to Google and you type in flip a coin, it's going to give you this very nice app uh, that you can click and it's going to give you a coin flip. So now that you flipped your coin, look at the outcome. If your coin, we're going to call it C1, came up tails, then respond to me truthfully. If it came up heads, then flip another coin or flip the same coin again. Let's call this coin flip C2. If C2 is heads, then respond yes. If C2 is tails, then respond no. So now if you use this procedure and you give me your response, which would be yes or no in either case, then the expected number of yes answers, I'm going to denote that by the variable A, is actually three quarters of P plus one quarter of one minus P. And that is one quarter plus P divided by two. Having made this very simple derivation, we can estimate the fraction of the folks listening online who did wear a face mask yesterday as two times the number of yes answers we received minus one half. Now, what's interesting here is that privacy comes from plausible deniability. And I apologize here, my question just changed because when I first prepared these slides, the incriminating question of the day was, did you go out drinking over the weekend? 
Um, so this is what this, the second slide still, still has. And this mechanism that I just showed to you is known as randomized response. So once again, the idea here is that because I'm flipping a second coin, I am adding some noise to the answer. I am adding randomization. And this is what gives plausible deniability to each individual when they give their answer. In other words, if you respond to me yes or no, because of the second coin flip, I'm not going to know whether this is because in fact the truth is yes or no, or if because noise was added. And so on, with an understanding that noise was added and that I'm not going to take your answer at face value to harm you in any way or to learn anything about you in particular in any way, um, is helping you be more comfortable by actually responding. And because we have designed this mechanism, I, as a researcher, will be able to gain the insights that I need about the proportion of the population that wears face masks or that goes out drinking over the weekend. So this illustration, this randomized response mechanism, is similar uh, or it's, it serves as basis for many of these uh, more advanced differential privacy mechanisms that we will employ to uh, develop privacy preserving data analysis solutions. And there we always want to think of privacy as two sides of a coin. On the one hand, we want to protect an individual. On the other hand, we want to learn information that is meaningful, statistically meaningful about the population. To protect an individual, we're going to be embedding plausible deniability. To learn about the population, we're going to be producing noisy estimates of the statistical quantities that we want to learn. Now, some of you may have worked with uh, other mechanisms that aim to preserve privacy. One such mechanism is de-identification, also known as anonymization, meaning that uh, I could collect data from people, such as responses to the questions that I just asked, and then simply drop the identifying attribute or attributes, their ID numbers, their names, their mailing addresses. Unfortunately, this doesn't work uh, because of auxiliary information that may be available on the web or otherwise. And fundamentally, this is due to the curse of dimensionality. Every two people uh, differ from each other in some way. How dim high dimensional data is sparse is another way to say this. And the more you know about people, the less likely it is that two individuals will look alike. And this will help you re-identify people even if you drop identifying information. Uh, the identified data can be re-identified with a linkage attack. And here again, I'm going to mention an experiment, uh, a brilliant experiment that is due to Latanya Sweeney, uh, who at that time was a graduate student. This is 1997. And she designed a linkage attack uh, to show that anonymized data can uh, be de-anonymized. In 1997, a Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission, this is a health insurance group, released anonymized data on employees of the state of Massachusetts in the US that showed every single hospital visit. Latanya Sweeney, who at the time was a graduate student, wanted to use this data to show that this anonymization is ineffective. So in, uh, in the US, states are governed by governors. So at the time, the governor of Massachusetts uh, was Bill Weld. He lived in a small town called Cambridge, Massachusetts, close to Boston. This is a town of 54,000 residents in which there are seven, seven zip codes. Zip codes are these geographic designations of areas in the United States. Latanya, uh, for $20, bought the complete voter registration rolls from the city of Cambridge. Um, and these are in the public domain, so you can buy this data publicly. And this is a database that contains, among other things, the name, address, zip code, birth date, and sex of every voter. Uh, and it turns out that when you correlate these two data sets, the anonymized uh, hospital visit records and the public voter rolls, 
only six people in Cambridge shared Governor Wells' birth date. Only three of them were men. And of all of them, only he lived in his particular zip code. And so with this information, Latanya was able to uh, send by mail to Governor Weld his health, uh, his hospital visit record. There was a follow-up study that showed that zip code, birth date, and sex are sufficient to identify 87% of all Americans. So you can read more about this very interesting study that motivates us to go beyond anonymization and into privacy preserving techniques in which we add noise to the process uh, at the link that is provided at the bottom. For additional information about privacy, about fairness, and about many other topics that fall under the umbrella of responsible data science, I invite you to visit my website, dataresponsibly.github.io, go to the courses area, and look at the courses that I have been teaching on this topic, where the reading lists, the slides, as well as exercises are publicly available. Uh, to wrap up, the punchline I want to make here is that data science seems to be, uh, is algorithmic, and therefore we might be tempted to say that it's not biased. And yet, as we've seen some examples, all traditional evils of discrimination and many new ones, in fact, exhibit themselves in the data science ecosystem. Transparency is what we need to help prevent discrimination, enable public debate and establish trust. And technology alone won't do. These are problems of the world that exhibit themselves in the data and therefore we need people, we need education, regulation and civic engagement to help work through these issues, to make the world better than it is today. Uh, these topics are for another talk. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, time to, to give you any thoughts on this, but I believe strongly that responsible data science is the only data science that we should be engaging in going forward and that it, it is our new frontier. Thank you very much. Uh, please stay in touch. Please visit dataresponsibly.github.io for more information on some of the work that my colleagues and students and I are doing and importantly for the educational materials on these topics. Thanks again.